<laughs> we'll just believe God this morning. I, I don't feel quite 100%, but hey, I, I, I believe that a lot of times that's a good thing, right? We got to be 100% until we get up there. Amen. Got something to look Amen. Amen. And uh, whenever, whenever we're not all there, I know that the Lord's going to have room to move. Amen. So we're going to go, be reading in Matthew chapter 5. I think I'm going to start a little series. I don't know how many messages we'll preach, but let's go ahead and, and read this passage of scripture and then we'll, we'll get into the, into the message. So this particular sermon here is known as the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus went up on a mountaintop. We're not told geographically exactly which mountain it is, but he went on the mountaintop and he began to teach. And it says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now, some people believe that, you know, it was the only the 12 disciples, but that doesn't seem to be what's being, uh, it, it, that's informing us here because it talks about the multitude. And whenever he said that, whenever he saw them is whenever he went to go sit down. And that's what rabbis did. They would sit down whenever they began to teach. And that it seems like really at this point in time, the multitude that, that many of the multitude would have already would have also gone up to follow after him. And so when he was said, his disciples came up to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted. For righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost his savor wherewith shall it be salted it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, Lord. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that your word would speak to us and that your word would reveal to us what you desire for us to hear from this passage of Scripture this morning. You know, I was going to just... Real quick, hopefully this looks okay. This is, if you've been coming to church here for a while, you've seen me draw this little stick man presentation before. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and draw it again because I just want to make a little point that we've, we've gone through this quite a bit in the past where we have described, I, I think you could call it the mechanics of what really happened on the inside of us whenever we got saved. Spiritually speaking, what took place whenever we gave our heart to the Lord? And what took place was, according to Romans chapter 6 and really Galatians 2.20, is that the old man that was born of Adam in the mind of God was baptized or placed into Christ where he became one with Jesus in his death and his burial but also his, his resurrection from the dead. And so now he's resurrected to a new life. And so now 
you know, now the 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 old man that was born of Adam is is dead, and that there's a new man that's born again in Christ, and so that's what it means to be born again. It means that that the old has been done away with, and that there's new now. Behold, all things you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You don't put new wine into an old wine skin. And, and, and this is what it's talking about individually or spiritually speaking, what happened in the spiritual realm when Jesus died on the cross. And it's been very, we've, we've tried very hard to, to communicate this message through the years because, because the mindset doesn't want to be able to receive this. Now, let me tell you why the mindset doesn't want to receive it. Because the enemy of your soul doesn't want you to be able to understand and to receive this, that at the core of this, the simplicity of this gospel is that Jesus has already done what needed to be done to give you access to the grace or the power of God for you to be able to function on this earth as a victorious Christian warrior. I'm sorry to tell you this morning, that's God's will for your life. Amen. Like, I mean, I'm happy to tell you, but it might not have been what you were hoping to hear. I can remember sitting one time in the, in the church that I used to be in leadership, and I can remember the pastor preached a great message on personal evangelism, but he apologized the whole time because people were cringing in their seat. Because people feel like that whenever you use a scripture or you share something with somebody that automatically you're supposed to be a preacher. No, we were all called to be witnesses of the king. I'm here to tell you. Listen, we're going to get into this message here in a little bit. And I got to tell you that God desires servants. Amen. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. And he's building a kingdom. And his servants serve him. Right, right. And, I, and, and we have put so much effort into understanding how spiritually what Jesus has done gives us access to this grace to help us. And you know, one of the things that I've learned through the years as I've studied is that the writings of the apostles, the letters specifically, Peter, John, but definitely Paul, are like commentary that explain the inner workings of the things that Jesus taught us. That's right. Right? But, but whenever we talk about the message of the cross, and we talk about the old man being dead and that a new man is alive. What is, what is that supposed to look like? You know, what is that supposed to look like in the real world? And so I'm hoping that this morning that we can get into that a little bit. So I wanna, I'm going to do a couple of sermons on some of Jesus' messages that come out of Matthew. So we're going to look at what Jesus said. And we're going to look at it from his perspective. And we're going to try to see what the Lord would say it's supposed to look like. Amen? Amen? And so Matthew presents Jesus as king. I want you to know that. I thought it was interesting that that uh, Angie redid the room in there, and it's all about the king of kings, and I really didn't know that she was doing that. And my first message this morning emphasizes the point that Matthew presents Jesus as king. Wow. So Matthew presents Jesus as king, and I guess the next question I would ask is, what is what does that king look like? You know, and, and then not only what does that king look like, but what do his subjects look like? What do his what do his people look like? Because, you know, there's a kingdom on this earth and there's a spirit that's prevalent on this earth. But and, and they expect human beings to look a particular way and, and they expect success to look a particular way. But what does Jesus look like? All right. And um, one of the, so this is who he's talking to. He's the king. Matthew's presenting him as the king. He's on this mountain. He's speaking. And when he sets down, his disciples come to him. And whenever they come to him, he opens his mouth and he begins to teach them. So what he's, what he, this is really his, like his, his inaugural address to the citizens of his kingdom. So if you're citizens of his kingdom this morning, this is what the Lord would say to you of what his kingdom is supposed to look like. And this is what the Lord would say to you of what his subjects or his citizens are supposed to look like. He says, first off, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs 
is the kingdom of God. First off, I want you to know that the word blessed there, if you look it up in the Strong's, it just speaks of happiness. But if you look into it a little bit deeper, one Greek scholar talked about the fact that it describes spiritual prosperity. See, the world has its own definition of what prosperity looks like. I'm here to tell you that Jesus, his definition of prosperity is not what the world says That's right. prosperity looks like. He's talking about being poor in spirit. I don't know how better to define what the Lord would say other than to describe what his kingdom would look like. When it comes to the poor in spirit, this is the one right here is talking about paupers. You see, in every kingdom, at least in the medieval times, whenever the King James Bible was written, you had princes, you had peasants, you had paupers. A peasant is somebody that, paupers and peasants are citizens, but a, but a, but a peasant is working for his food. A, a pauper is a beggar. The, the word literally in poor right there means one to cower over and to be destitute and to beg. I don't know about you, but there's a part to me that doesn't really like to be seen as a person that would be bowed over, cowered over. But you got to understand, Jesus is not wanting, every, Jesus turns everything upside down. But he's not wanting everybody to literally look like they're in rags and bent over and begging. That's a physical beggar. He's trying to talk about spiritually speaking. You see, a beggar is somebody that is not self-sufficient. Yeah. And, and the reality of it is, is that as humble as every one of us may think that we have been at some point in time in our life, reality is that most of the time we're not near as humble as That's what we right. think we are. Yeah. And that we're not near as poor in spirit as what we think we are. And that we're trying to hold on to something on the inside of us. We're trying, we're trying to still be seen in some kind of way. We still want some attention. We still want some focal point on us. Well, but what about, what about me? And there's some things on the inside of Matt that need to die. And there's some things on the inside of you that need to die. And Jesus would say, you that are poor in spirit, you're the one that's going to get the blessing. Yeah. Why? How do I get poor in spirit? I've already done it for you. You've already died in me. I've given grace to you. You got to walk with me and you need to understand what it's supposed to look like. Amen. He says that they're poor in spirit looking. This is, this is what Paul got. Paul got a revelation. He got a revelation that whenever he was trying, there was something that was in his life right here. He says, look, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want to go back to what I said something earlier. Jesus is turning everything upside down. I know that I keep saying it, but I don't know a better way to describe it. Every conversation that I get in with somebody, I'm trying to explain how the kingdom of God is so different than what our physical eyes are perceiving. You got, you got to see what I'm trying to tell you. Because listen, even in the world of business, even Christian businessmen can, can become duped into thinking that there's a certain way to do business. And, and, and that because it's business, then we do business the way business is done. No, sir. No, sir. Not if the Lord is your Lord. If the Lord is your Lord, you're his servant. You do business the way he does business. And that means that you also have to have a spirit of humility on the inside of you. The American mindset has duped us. I believe God wants you and I. He doesn't want you to have to walk around in pauper's clothes physically. Amen. You can be a multi-millionaire and still be poor in spirit. That's right. Yeah. Because of the spirit of humility that lives on the inside of you. Because if he is your Lord and your Savior, you can still submit. But look, the Apostle Paul, he had something that was going on in his life. He said, I asked the Lord three times to remove this thing from me. But this is what the Lord said. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. So for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I don't think that words can describe the fact that, again, Jesus, and I keep repeating it, born in a manger. It doesn't make any oh, sense. God. It doesn't make any sense. Why do you keep saying it? Because I can't get it out of my head. Kings aren't born in mangers. Kings aren't born with stinky animals. Kings are born in palaces. They wear silken clothes. Kings don't ride donkeys. They ride stallions. But God says, this is my kingdom. This is what it looks like. 
and the spirit of the world is against me, and the spirit of the world doesn't look anything like me, and if you're looking like them, you're not looking like me. Poor in spirit is going to get a blessing. Now, the, one, of the, one of the best ways to try to understand what Jesus is saying is to see what Jesus says. <laughs> and, and, and if you look at this right here, you'll remember this story. Jesus beholding him loved him. And, you know, if you remember this story, this is that rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He kind of challenges him. But he's wanting to know, what must I do to inherit this eternal life? And Jesus starts to say some things to him, and he says, well, I've already done all of that. But Jesus knew there was this one little spot. He wasn't poor in spirit. And Jesus said, okay, then, one thing that you lack, go the, your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. You see, it all goes back to the cross. Yeah. Because, see, the cross is a lifestyle. The cross is a lifestyle of dying to self because self is in the way of God getting glory in our lives. Because the more of our old man that continues to live and continues to be reflected in our life, the less people see Jesus. This, this rich young ruler, he couldn't see it that way. You know, he wanted to hold on. To whatever it was that he had, it made him, it, it frustrated him, and he ended up walking away, and he did not follow after the Lord. Poor in spirit will be blessed, amen? The second thing is, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, the way to understand mourning for me is, I looked at a couple of other scriptures, this scripture right here, some of, some, some of the religious leaders were questioning Jesus, and they said to him, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples fast? And Jesus said to them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. So the idea was, was that fasting at that point in time was descriptive of a, of a, of a mourning, of, of really pouring oneself out. And, and really and seeking, right? Uh, going without, okay? But what Jesus was saying is, is that I'm still with them. I'm with them. Now's a time of rejoicing for them. But there's going to come a time when I'm not going to, to be here anymore. And then they're going to mourn. <clears throat> they're going to mourn because I'm, there, there's something that's going to be lacking. Does that make sense? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gone. Just like even in John 14, whenever... Whenever Jesus told Philip, he said, I'm going away to my father's house to build a mansion. If it weren't so, I would not tell you. But you know the way. And, and, and Philip was like, I don't, we don't know the way. Tell us the way. He said, no, you know the way. And you've seen, you've seen me. You've seen the father. You, you know the way. They were already starting to, to realize that he, was, that he would soon be gone. And they were already feeling almost like a, I mean, for lack of better words, a separation anxiety. It wasn't, it, it didn't feel right because he was missing. Here's, a, here's another spot right here uh, where Jesus rose early the first day of the week. This is after his resurrection. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with them as they mourned and wept. I want you to notice that the mourning has to do with something isn't right. Something is missing. Yeah. Jesus they didn't, they didn't realize that he had resurrected yet, but, but something's not right, and they're already missing it. Can I tell you that, that God is mourning over this earth right That's now? Right. Do, you under, yeah. do you understand that? God is mourning because things still aren't right. Mm. Things still aren't set right. Yes, Jesus has come, and he's brought us to the place where we can now operate in the grace of the Lord. But this is not a completed final work yet. And God desires for you and I to mourn for what he mourns for. And what he desires is for this world to be made right. For people's hearts and lives to be made right. What the Lord is wanting you and I to do is to begin to see things the way that he sees them. That's right. He's the king. Amen. It's his kingdom. We're his citizens. And he's wanting us to see it his way. 
Yeah. Amen? It's a big difference between, you know, and I've been, this has really been on my heart, and I've been sharing it with y'all over the last year. <clears throat> a big difference to be a person that says, I believe and I love God. And I'm not, listen, I, I want to calm down with coming across so abrasive. I don't want to be abrasive. I honestly don't. But listen, there's a big difference between somebody that says they love God and goes to church versus somebody that is serving the Lord. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's right. Preacher. Because when you're serving the Lord, you're making life decisions based upon your relationship with God. You're realizing that the way you speak to people, the way you interact in society, the decisions you make, the way you treat other people is a direct reflection on your king Come and on, your man. king's kingdom. Come on. Amen. And that's what a servant does. He makes decisions based on that. And guess what? Now that we understand the message of the cross or the message of New Testament truth or the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified or the new covenant or whatever you want to call it, we are without excuse, my friend. We have been given the grace that we need in order to be able to walk with the Lord and to live the way God has called us to live. So I don't know about you, but I... I want my heart to, I want to be, you know, if we mourn for what God mourns for, you know what's going to happen? Ooh, One thing, help us, help yes. us Lord. We're going to be, we're going to have a desire for soul. Yeah. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life that I've had more of a desire to see souls won than what I do right now. I'm just being transparent with you. There's been times in my life that I've been driving down the road and every car that passes by, I'm like, oh, it's over. It's like a family in that, in that car driving through. I remember I used to go pick up Dale at the trailer park and I just drive through there and I was like, look at all these souls. And I just start crying out, Lord, Lord, cause us to become hungry for souls. We become complacent in our life. We become complacent going through the monotony and the detail of life. We didn't even get fat and sassy thinking that we know so much of the gospel that we forget the importance of people that don't know the Lord. Jesus. Help us, Lord. Yes. And anoint us. Yes. Not just full of knowledge and being yes. puffed up, but with love. Yes. For if I have not love, I'm just a tinkling clanging brass and a tinkling cymbal. Right. You know, I don't want to be that. Look, they mourn because God's will is incomplete. They mourn because it's not right. They mourn because they don't have him. There's another stage to this thing, my friend. There's a, there's a time coming when Jesus is literally going to rule and reign on this earth. It's going to happen. I know, I know to the natural mind, it almost sounds sci-fi. But I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen. Jesus is going to rule and reign on this earth. There's going to be a whole nother stage, a whole nother chapter to be written. I love talking about that kind of stuff, but we, I don't, it's a whole nother chapter to look forward to. Yeah. And where we live today affects that tomorrow. That's the parable of the talents. Look, blessed are they, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, I was sharing the other day whenever Troy and I had that long conversation. Something that the Lord showed me early on when I, when I really didn't understand the Word of God, but when God was doing that early work in my heart, He would just give me these little concepts, you know? And I remember I'd write them down, and I remember that there was this one concept that the Lord gave me, and it was like an image of a stallion. So I could see this, this stallion, it was like a black stallion, and he was like glistening in the sun. His, his muscles were ripped, and he had a long mane, and he, boy, he was proud. You know, and he was just running, and, and he just looked like the perfect epitome of a, of a stallion horse. And you know, when, when, I, when I envisioned that, the Lord said, a stallion is of no use to his master until he is broken. You can't do nothing with that. You can't do nothing with him. All you can do is sit there and watch him and admire his rippling muscles. And you can't plow with him. You can't ride him. Yeah, you might be, well, you might be able to breathe with him. But other than that, everything else that he's going to do, he's going to do it according to his own That's will. Right. But right. but Lord, let the Lord break him. Yeah. See, yeah. poor in spirit doesn't mean poor in getting things done for the Lord. Right. Meek in spirit doesn't mean weak in spirit. As a matter of fact, if you consider the concept, see, you know, Lord, give me scripture later to talk about that broken stallion. Because you know how much power is in a stallion even though he's broken? Oh, it's there. It's just that he's willing to listen to his master's command. 
He's willing to do what it is that his purpose was meant to do. And whenever they came to get Jesus in the garden, I don't know if you'll remember, but he said, whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. He turns and in the Greek he said, I am. And when he said, I am, they fell to the ground. He said, did you not know that I could call a legions of my father's angels? Amen. And they could have come and read, but, but controlled power. Instead, he willingly went with them. He said, no man takes my life. I willingly lay it down. And there he hung naked on a cross. There he hung naked on a cross as they ridiculed him. I preached about it recently as they scoffed at him, as they mocked him. Come down off that cross, you who said you could rebuild the temple in three days. And he hung there on that cross and he died for you and I. And there was such great power in that. I don't think I'm doing a good job of communicating what I'm trying to say. This yeah. In some kind of way, shape or form, there is something that is turned upside down in the kingdom of God. Yeah. That when you and I humble ourselves, are poor in spirit, are willing to operate in meekness, some great power source that is greater than the universe, the very power source that speaks the world into existence, that keeps the atoms rotating the way that they are, comes to work on your behalf. Is it going to happen the way you want to see it? Are you going to are you going to tell the clouds to move? Maybe sometimes. I don't I'm not even worried about that. I just want his hand to be with me and whatever it is I need at that moment in time that he would be with me. That he would give me the strength that I need. Yeah. Amen. I'm telling you, I have seen in little instances, sometimes even silly things, mm. where he's asking me to humble myself. It's almost like it's a test. Yeah. Sometimes it's if I get into a disagreement with somebody. And guess what? I wasn't the only one that was completely wrong. I mean, I'm, come on. I mean, I, I know enough about myself to know when I'm wrong. But I'm not always the one that's 100% wrong. As a matter of fact, for the most part, I can usually get along with people. But sometimes, even though somebody else had some fault, that other person may not be willing to humble themselves. Is it my job to judge that? And to be like, well, if they refuse to humble themselves and be meek and poor in spirit and come to me, that's not what the Word of God says. That's right. If your brother has ought against you, you go to him. That's what the word of God. Oh, but that's that's going to uh, ruffle my spiritual feathers. That's going to make me look less than. I'm going to show, you know, I'm going to show that I'm weaker than. Come on, man. I'm trying to say that there's something that Jesus has flipped upside down in this kingdom. And that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And if we're willing to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, trusting God. Now, listen. Can I tell you that when you do that, that the enemy is already going to be there waiting yeah. to try to make you feel foolish? Yeah. When you make yourself vulnerable like that, when you, when you say, well, you know what? I don't think that this person, something went wrong between us. And, and I feel like the Lord is telling me to be the one to go to them and to humble myself. And you do that. Can I, can I prepare you for a bad day? Even though that person may be a believer. Can I go ahead and just prepare you that that person is probably going to have an air of pride in them? And you'll be able to sense it. You'll be able to feel some kind of distance in the little hug, the little pat on your back. And you'll be able to sense that, yes, you finally came around to your way of thinking. Listen to me. Get past that. Get past that and understand that the Lord is doing something in you that, that cannot be done in the person that's not willing to humble himself. Right, that's good. He's flipped it all upside down. It doesn't make any sense to the logical mind. I'm trying to talk about the power of God. I'm not talking about American capitalism. I'm not talking about Trump Tower. I'm not talking about TBN. I'm talking about real Jesus, real time, right in the town on a donkey and being born in the manger. King of kings, Lord of lords. Yes. All the power of the universe at his disposal. All principalities and powers under his feet. Fallen angels, demon spirits, ain't nothing more powerful than the God you serve. You have access to the power of God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here he is right here. Look at this. Tell ye, daughter of Zion, behold your king comes unto you meek and sitting upon an ass 
an occult, a foal of an ass. <laughs> Your king comes to you. Now listen, good news, Zechariah had already prophesied this about 500 years before. Yep. So some of them were able to recognize it. Zechariah, 500 years before Jesus ever showed up, before he was ever born, prophesied that the king of kings, that the Messiah would come into town riding on a donkey. God's so good. He don't, he don't want nobody to miss it. He doesn't want anybody to miss it. But even in the midst of all of that, they still couldn't see what God was really saying. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Amen. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Merciful. You feel like you're a merciful person? Are you, are you willing to not get your day in court? I can remember. I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, you know, somebody did me wrong. Well, they got, they got something. They got deserve. They got, they, they deserve something. <laughs> you know, I can remember one time if something went down. I know I've told the story before, but most of you won't remember. We were going through something in our life with a family member, a person that I was close to. And it, there was a lot of conflict that was created. And I really felt like that, that other person was completely wrong. You know, I mean, that's what I thought. And, and I'll be honest with you, I really think for the most part they were. <laughs> but, but that's another story. But nevertheless, I was driving down the road. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was thinking about it. And the Lord said, how dare you? How dare you hold them in contempt? Mm. I didn't hold you in contempt. Jesus said to my spirit, he said, do you think that I didn't mean it when I said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. As I hung on that cross and they had ridiculed me and mocked me, Matt, do you think that those were just empty words? When I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? No, I meant it when I said it. I came to forgive. And if you're my servant, you're going to learn how to forget. Amen. You're going to learn how to humble your heart. And you're going to learn how to love again. And to release it. And to let it go. And guess what my friend. That's probably some of the best advice I can give you this morning. Amen. Because if you continue to harbor in your heart. Bitterness. Frustration. Anger. And aggravation towards other people. You know what it's going to do? It's going to jam you up. Yep. It's going to mess you up. And it's going to prevent you from being able to move forward. With the Lord. How dare we hold them in contempt? Are we merciful? You know, this scripture right here helps me to understand mercy a little better. This Hebrews 2.17. Because see, it says right here, wherefore in all things it behooved him. The idea behind behooved is that he was compelled. But in reality, there's even a deeper meaning. He was indebted. It was it was, he was indebted to do this. What did he do? If you go up a couple of verses, it says that because the children, talking about you and I, were partakers of flesh and blood, he became the same. See, God, Jesus, the eternal son, Jesus, the eternal word, had to become flesh. Why did he have to become flesh? Because he had to be able to die for us. It behooved him, he was indebted for him to be made like his brethren. Why? So that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. I want to break that down for a second. Because see, we're talking about being merciful. And part of being merciful requires that you and I can understand what mercy means. What I'm trying to get at is, I mean, I'm not trying to use a psychological word, but they say empathy is a little different than sympathy. Sympathy says, oh, ta -ta, I feel so bad for you. I feel sorry for you. Empathy means I can feel it. I, I understand. See, but if you're self-righteous in your walk with God, you done forgot where you were. Or if you're self-righteous in your walk with God, you're like, but I never had that problem. I've done told you some of the craziest stories before about how when the Lord got a hold of me and, you know, I would sit there before the Lord truly set me free and I would, and I was dipping a can and a half of, of dip a day, shoving that stuff in my lip. And then I would see another Christian smoking a cigarette and I would be hypocritical in judgment, thinking that, now, how do you come up with that, dude? That's a straight up demonic spirit, right? Come on. 
yeah. or even after I got free from the dip, it still try to live in there. Oh, it still tries to creep its ugly little head. I'd be like, man, I'm lifting up two hands. That old boy over there, he's only got one and it's just barely even up. Come on, y'all know that I'm not the only one that thinks crazy things like that. <laughs> we forget where we used to be. Yeah, we forget where God brought us from. Yeah, yeah. And we think that our Christianity is better than other people's. Yeah. I'm not the only one that's dealt with this, my friend. Yeah. Self-righteousness will infect every single believer. That's right. If you allow it to, it will take hold in you. And you will begin to believe that you are better because you didn't do the sins that they did. And then you can't empathize with them. You can't understand. And because you can't give mercy, you may not obtain mercy yourself one day. The Lord is merciful, amen? Aren't you glad he's been merciful to you? I'm glad he's been merciful to me. Lord, help me. To be merciful. He said, hey, listen, we're getting close to the end here. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, <clears throat> I've been thinking about this concept for a long time. And I'm not trying to prevent, pre pretend I got the market cornered on this. But if you read most commentaries, the main thing that they focus on is that salt is a preservative. And we know that, right? Back in the day before they had refrigeration, they would salt meat, right? And that's how they would use it. But I'm telling you right now that in this message... The main thing that sticks out to me is the, is the difference between the people that are in God's kingdom versus what's going on around them. Does that make sense? Because he's having this conversation. He's the king. He's on the mountain. He's speaking to his disciples. He's teaching them and he's saying, and he's teaching some, some opposite points of what they're used to in the world. Blessed are those that are meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. That's not stuff that people have heard. Nobody wants to live that way. One of the things that I, listen, I like to cook. I'm not trying to tell you that I'm that, I'm that good at it. But I've learned enough about savory cooking to know one thing about salt. Salt brings distinction of flavors. It allows one to discern subtle differences. If you've ever cooked before, I'm telling you right now. I've, I've done it. When I first got married and met Miss Angela, she cooked this dish called pasta aglio e olio. Yeah. Olive oil, garlic, a little bit of Romana cheese. And I can remember, man, I'm about to cook me some pasta aglio olio. And I, poured, I put the garlic in there, stirred it up, tasted it. There ain't no garlic in here. Put some more garlic in here, stir it up, taste it. There ain't no garlic in here. Danielle says, I think you need a little salt. Put a little salt in there. Oh, wow, dude, I killed vampires for five days. <laughs> salt does something to the food that, dis that distinguishes and allows the different flavors. I don't know how it, the chemistry works, but it does something. If y'all cook before, y'all know what I'm talking about. You can oversalt food, but you can also undersalt it. When you get the right amount in there, everything starts to pop. What I'm trying to tell you is Jesus is trying to say, listen, your presence upon this earth shows a difference shows a distinction to the world That's around good. you. Okay. When you, when those that mourn for the things that God mourns for are seen by the world around them, they see that there's something different. When those that are meek in spirit begin to operate in meekness, the world around them that is yeah. full of pride yeah. sees something different. When those that are poor in spirit begin to operate the way that God wants them to, the world, when you're merciful to people that do you dirty, the world around you begins to see the difference. You become salt in the earth. I didn't plan to put this next picture on here. But, I, you know, me, I don't know if it's a curse, but there's a conspiracy behind every door. I looked at this thing right here, and I said, look at this. The world done flipped something around. Okay, now, maybe I'm digging too deep. Just forgive me. Don't be salty. Wait, hold on a second. Jesus says you're the salt of the earth. And so then the world says, don't be salty. Uh -huh. But what they did was they actually completely flipped the script. And I'm not trying to say they did it on purpose, but I wouldn't be surprised. They completely flipped the script and said that salty means this. When in reality, Jesus is saying salt is the opposite of what they're saying salt is. Right? Because a salty person got a bad attitude, not acting right, you know, whatever, whatever. Don't be salty with me. And Jesus is saying, no, the salt of the earth is humble. Yeah. The salt of the earth is meek. Wow. The salt of the earth mourns after, who am I supposed to listen to? Am I supposed to listen to 
Jesus, or am I supposed to listen to what the world says? But then it gets even worse, because I was about to, I said, you know what, it's getting late. It's time for me to turn this iPad. But then I said, why that girl, why is that girl, this is bringing the conspiracy to a whole other level. Why is that girl pouring that salt down on the ground behind her? Is she making this salt on the ground to, because it's only worthy to be trodden on under the foot of men? Like Jesus said, I don't know, I'm probably overreaching, but nevertheless, that's exactly the opposite of what the Lord said. Don't lose the savor of your salt because then you're not worth anything other than to be thrown on the ground and trodden under the foot of men. I'm here to tell you that you are the salt of the earth. Amen. You make a distinction on this earth. As you and I learn to die in Christ daily, as you and I learn to grow in the Lord, as you and I learn to allow the Holy Spirit to conform us into the image of Christ, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what Jesus said. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be headed, hidden. Uh, no man lights a candle and hides it under a bushel. He said, let your light shine before all men so that, that men might see your works and it might glorify your Father in heaven. Yes, yes. You know, I always loved that parable. It's a little small parable within. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Because see, when you begin to study, that's why I love geography. That's why I love to try to understand the Bible land the best that I can, because it brings a whole new meaning. When you understand Jerusalem was actually built up on a city. That's why when it says that a man went down to Jericho, it didn't mean that Jericho was south. It meant Jerusalem was topographically higher in altitude and he went down because it was a mountainous area. Right. And whenever travelers would travel, many times they would have to travel during the nighttime. And it was the whole Jordan Valley. It's a valley system and it's a it's a system of valleys and rocky crags. And they would have to travel through rocks and cliffs and various things like that. And so this meant something to them because, see, they're on a long journey. It's dark. It's nighttime. And then all of a sudden you can see the glimmer of the hope. There's the city. We're, all, we're almost there. And Jesus is equating that to, to your life. He's equating that to my life. We, we know that according to John 1, he was the light that was given to mankind from God the Father. But here he says, you're the light of the world. Because when we got saved, that light was transferred from him and transferred into us. You are the light of the world. That song, you know, even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You are light in the darkness. He's light in the darkness. And he wants to give us that light. Amen. So that that light can be shared with others. Musicians, if y'all wouldn't mind coming, we want to close out in worship. And if you need prayer this morning, the altars are always open. But we, we definitely want to go out of this place thanking the Lord and worshiping him this morning. This is my conclusion right here. And when he was set. See, the rabbi got up on the mountain and he sat down ready to teach. And when he was set, what happened? His disciples, his learners, those that wanted to serve him, the citizens of his kingdom. What did they do? They came unto him. Are we going to come to Jesus this morning? Are we going to come to hear the teachings of our master? He opened his mouth and he taught them. And that is what he said. Father, we thank you this morning. We pray that you'd have your way in our life, oh Lord. We want to leave out of this house worshiping you. We thank you, Lord, for your awesome word, oh Lord. Your word that teaches us, Lord, that you have a different way of doing things. Do that in our lives, Lord. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.